Okay, good. We're on there. All right, so now we can officially start. Um, I'll just start us with some prayer and then we can read the text. Lord Jesus, we thank you that we can all gather remotely and be together. And thank you that you're with us. And I pray you would inspire us as we read this text tonight and show us more or teach us something new, whatever it is you want to tell us through this. And um, let our discussions be full of your spirit with new insights and um, new refreshment. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, okay, so tonight, everyone sees where we're at. We are in Luke, got to get back to my first text, Luke 9, 1 through 7, um, or 1 through 9, yeah. You're really going to the end of 9, that's what, that's no, what I couldn't, couldn't Luke, Luke 9, 1 through 9, to the yeah. end of the 9 verses, yes. Yeah, very good. Why, you think that's too much or too little? No, I wasn't sure. Because <laughs> I thought once we get into Herod and John the Baptist. Oh, I know. I, I didn't know. It's all a tangle, but I think we'll find that um, Luke, you know, as he built his gospel, he just keeps circling back. He's circling back while circling out at the same time. That's my impression anyway. So um, does anyone who would like to read verses one to six? Can I read it? I've got it here. Yes, go for it. Now, when Yeshua called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. He sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God to heal. And he said to them, take nothing for the journey, no walking stick, no travel bag, no bread, no money, nor even to have two shirts. Whatever house you enter, stay there and depart from there. And whoever does not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a witness against them. So they went out and began traveling throughout the villages, proclaiming the good news and healing everywhere. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was happening. He was very confused because some were saying that John had been raised from the dead, that others that Elijah had appeared, and others that some prophet from among the ancients had arisen. But Herod said, I beheaded John, but who is this about whom I hear such things? And he kept trying to see him. Yeah. Stop there. Yep, yeah, that's good. That is good. And um, what, what um, translation were you reading? I was reading the Tree of Life version. Tree of Life, okay. Nice. Okay. So, by the way, how many of you guys out there have this book? Somewhere, I think. <laughs> I think I do. Sorry. I have it 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 it. It. It's a nice book to have about, um, you know, historical archaeological background, but Every time we run into the Herod family, I always grab my book because it's such a messed up family. And um, it's so hard to keep them all straight, you know? So I want to show you a page. Uh, we brought it to Bible study before. The author? So, Somewhere we've got, we got a printout of the whole page. Who, yeah. Who's the author? Who's the, the author? author? Is Peter Connolly. Oh, okay. N double L. Yeah, Peter. Okay, let me just check. Okay. So, if you're ever reading through the New Testament, you're confused with Herod's and whatever. This is his family tree. That shows you it's not easy. <laughs> he has nine wives, and they all have kids. And as all kids do of different wives, they you know they rival and they fight against each other. I'll lead it up again and keep talking and I can get a picture of it. Oh, I don't think it'll come out that clear, will it? Yeah, I'll get enough to give people an idea how confused it is. Yeah, you can see all the pipes. <laughs> okay, thanks. So, um, don't. Okay. Antipas is down here. 
He's married Herodias. After Herodias was married to his brother, Philip. There's all kinds of intrigue here. And Antipas only comes to power after um, Alexander and Aristobulus, who are like set to, to be the next leaders after Herod, they, they got um, ixed out of the way, enough accusations against them. And so Herod had to choose someone else. Um, but it's fascinating. This, this book kind of lays out the whole family saga. And so you can read about it. It would make a great show. Um, I can think of some modern TV shows that it, it could rival. Um, Too much violence. Oh, yeah. Violence, intrigue, you know, people worry that they're going to be turned in by someone else. So they have to turn them in first or they, they try to blame other people, scapegoat other people. Well, the sexual improprieties are pretty good, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's that as well. Um, it's interesting because this author tries really hard not to um, make Herod look like, not to demonize him. It's interesting, but he was pretty, pretty um, ambitious and paranoid and all of that. Um, I would be in that number of mother-in-laws. Yeah, well, right. Well, it was all his wife's. Mm. That's a problem. He claims he married 10 times, but I see at the bottom, the last two are no names. Mm. So I, I can't imagine Herod would marry a no name. But yeah, so, so after his death in the end, he, he decided at first he was just going to give it to one son. Um, but then he changed his mind and he's forever changing his mind. He's a little fickle that way, but he divvied up the land and he, he uh, bequeathed it to three sons. Mm. So in the Galilee area, it was Antipas. Mm. And then there was a Philip. He was up to the Northeast um, Golan kind of area. I think I have another. There you can see. That might be too, uh, too small for you to see. Can you see that? <laughs> no, way too small, but there's a Lake of Galilee. So on, on that side of the lake and then down there, Antipas was the ruler. So, so the three sons of Herod who finally take over, Antipas, Philip, and who's number three? Um, that was, um, hold on. Don't want to get his name wrong for posterity. Um, um, Archelaus. Oh yeah, Archelaus. Right, and Antipas and Archelaus are brothers. They're all brothers. Uh, yeah, they're they're all brothers and uncles, and they're all. Actually, it's interesting because they all seem to hate their dad, and yet they're all trying to take over from him. And so they kind of have to accuse each other so that it puts them in good light. And it seems like um, the, the son that Herod favored, really until the end, he didn't want to admit that oh. he was in intrigue against him. Ooh. And it was only at the very end that he finally kind of admitted it. Um, yeah, there's all kind of fascinating stories. Anyway, so so this Herod Antipas is up in the Galilee. And they're all the kind of um, family that's Jewish, but only kind of superficially. Like, I don't know what I would compare it to. You know, they want to be international, let's say. They want to be in the Roman esteemed, I don't know what. Um, they were Edomites, weren't they, Sharon? Edomian, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah but they, they, they would, I mean, they consider themselves Jewish. But the Jews did not consider them Jewish, even though they were 
proselytes, they would, so is a, a, a more general question, is a proselyte considered fully of Torah saying you needed, I mean, to be an Israelite and by, by birth? In, depends what age you're talking about, what it means to convert or, I mean, a proselyte is just someone who converts, right? But Edomians, I believe they're all circumcised. And that was one of the big signs of being Jewish is to be circumcised. Mm -hmm. And of course, to keep the law. Um, but it's kind of a case Herod of- Herod the Great's father, hmm. Herod the Great's father, you know, his family were forcibly converted. Or were they? I don't know. Were, were they? I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know. Yes. Un, under the Hasmoneans, they were, they were circumcised and converted. Hmm. Uh, so it wasn't that long back, you're saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. You know, it's funny. There's a... Today, there were... <clears throat> Yes. Mm -hmm. Got a little bit. Sharon, we, we in... seem to have jumped the calling of the 12 and have gone straight to well, Herod. No, I know, I know. We're going back. Um, but let Dan make his comment. I was just saying that in, in today in the Knesset, they were having a really, really heated debate where they were screaming at each other over... Um, wanting to change the law of return, it it wasn't passed. But um, you know, the law of return is th is that if you have one one Jewish grandparent, uh, um, you are eligible um, to uh, make Aliyah to immigrate to Israel um, as a citizen. Um, yet, having one Jewish grandparent is not enough to be considered Jewish according to halakha, it's not enough to be considered Jewish according to, to Jewish um, orthodoxy or Jewish practice. But, but of course, it was enough for Hitler to send you to the gas chambers. And so that was what guided the writing of that law was that if it's enough, if it was, if it was enough for someone to lose their life, um, then we ought, it ought to be enough for us to, to try to protect that person. And yet there have been a lot of people immigrating in the last few years who um, their lifestyle has been very, much less Jewish than a lot of religious Jews here have, have um you know are, are willing to tolerate and so it's the religious jewish parties that are well, wanting they may not be jewish to change at all the law. In that sense. yeah they, they're not leading jewish lives at all and um and so the, it's it's some of the more religious jewish parties that are wanting to change the law even though it was the jewish religious parties who wrote the law as it exists today in the first place wow. they're the ones who first i first identified it way back in the 60s um, what's important when people write laws is not just a law to write, but to write <clears throat> why you're making that law. Because yeah. so people forget, they forget even policies. Oh, why do we do that? Or why, why have we decided to make that decision? And like, we just write down, we're doing this because of this. Then people yeah. can keep it straight. Like, oh yeah. Of, of course, decide. of course you, they, they wouldn't, they wouldn't ever have wanted to put that in the, in the writing that they couldn't ever agree on who is a Jew and why, and they would never want to say that Hitler was the, was the animating, animating impetus of, of what was able to bring them all together. Who would have perished under Hitler's um, edict, let's yes. say. And so these are the people we want to make sure we include and save. Yeah. Yeah, but, but, but it's interesting that, that because right, because the issue always <laughs> never really ever went back to that. It was always a conflict over who is a Jew, and you've got the split between you can have two perfectly legit Jewish parents like mine, but I'm not exactly practicing in the terms of of orthodoxy, 
and that becomes a terrible problem. But the issue really is now, for the, particularly for the Russians who come out of very, very confused Jewish backgrounds. They can usually find one Jewish grandparent somewhere down the line, but they've really forgotten what it means completely. And in terms of the of, of many of the Orthodox family um, um, groups here, it's they don't they 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 need converting like the poor like the Jews out of Ethiopia. They had to go through iniquitous conversion things. Right. And a whole delegitimizing of their authorities. I don't know if we want to do this, go into this now, but it's a huge issue. Yeah, we should. Sure. Yeah. Not to mention that. Not to mention Jewish believers. But their their right to um, make aliyah is not limited to Jews in that regard. If this rule about you know, basically going against Hitler's law you know to set it on its head it allows people to immigrate who are not strictly jews but it's enough that they would have been they would have perished in the holocaust if hitler had known their ancestry right so but there are plenty of jewish believers who whose parents and grandparents perished in the holocaust who happen to be believers in yeshua and that lets you off the hook completely and you're not considered Jewish by the Israelis. Well, that's a different, that's different from the law. You know, whether people follow their own laws, you know, that's a whole other no, thing. But in terms of the law, you're not allowed to, to make Aliyah. They'll do everything to stop you. And technically, you can't be buried here, yeah. married here, or anything else. You have to go off to right. get called Christian and go off to Cyprus. Anyway. Emma, there we go. Okay, so... Um, so it's interesting here, I mean, this is in Luke, we start out, this is the calling of 12 disciples together, and he's sending them out. And I love this passage for many reasons. I mean, I think a lot of people don't sit and ponder it, that he's sending people out while he is still alive mm -hmm. to proclaim the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. And to heal the sick. And of course, you have those two things together. We can look back at all the passages in Luke, and you see those two things come together a lot. Um, I don't know what exactly he said when he said he gave them power and authority, but obviously they understood that they had that power and authority. I do want to read, though, the other passage where he sends out the 70, because I think when you compare them, you kind of notice one interprets another or just adds in a couple more details. Um, but the connection between the kingdom of God and healing the sick is very strong. And I think just reading through the Gospels, we've already seen that. And in fact, we know at the end of Luke, we know that Jesus had many, many, many healing stories. And the ones chosen for us, and also the ones in, um, the ones in John that are chosen, are specific. You know, like we looked at last week, they're kind of symbolic, and that's why they were chosen. Um, but there were many, and this was supposed to be a mark of the kingdom of God. And so he says to take nothing, you know, basically no overnight bag, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, not even extra clothes. And so that's pretty hardcore. I was, you know, I think to myself, it's just like walk out your door and, and go to a village and just start talking to them. And of course, this works in the first temple period, sorry, not first temple, first century period, when there was um, such a culture of entertaining rabbis, traveling rabbis. That is a known thing, and it's a privilege to host people. And it's also a, a mitzvah. It's a, it's a commandment to host people. And so... In that sense, it's different from today, but it, it's still pretty extreme that you you know you're not taking anything with you. Um, and you know you go into one house and stay there till you leave the area. So Sharon, it would be normal for a rabbi to send his disciples out, would it? Well, that's what I'm not sure. I mean, it, it could be. Um, normally, the disciples are always traveling around with the rabbis. Yeah. But I suppose at a certain point. They would, you know, it's like an apprentice. At a certain point, they could start working full time, so to speak. Um, but here, it seems to be um, a practice, a practice try because he does it again later. And of course, when he leaves the earth, he 
really mm -hmm. sends everybody out. Um, but they go out and they're proclaiming good news. And we're assuming that that would be, you know, the good news that Jesus proclaimed in the synagogue in Luke 4, which goes back to Isaiah 61. Um, mm -hmm. And healing people. Um, well, I don't even have the, it's so funny, I don't even have the um, dust in mind today. Hmm. But I wanted to read Luke 10. So it's as if we jump over the next couple passages, which we're going to go back to later. But if you look at Luke 10, you have a similar sending out. Um, this time of the 72. So we have rings of disciples, some closer than others to Jesus. And I've here... Got 70. You've got 72, have you? Um, yes. There is a textual issue here. I've not delved into it. Ah, yeah. Well... It's either 70 or 72, depending which oh, text you want to go with. In 10.1, I've got 70. And in 10.17, I've got the 70 returning. Hmm. Um, anyway, it's, it's certainly divisible by two if he's sending them out two by two. Right. And in this case, he's sending them out ahead of himself. And you get a little bit more of a, a fuller rendition. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Go, I am sending you out like lambs surrounded by wolves. Do not carry a money bag, a traveler's bag, or sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whenever you enter a house, first say, may peace be on this house. And if a peace-loving person is there, your peace will remain on him. But if not, it will return to you. Stay in that same house, eating and drinking what they give you, for the worker deserves his pay. Um, so again, he, he's kind of giving all the same directives. It's just a little bit fuller here, what that means. Do not move around from house to house. Whenever, oops, sorry, my thing just jumped. Whenever you enter a town and the people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in that town and say to them, the kingdom of God has come upon you. But whenever you enter a town and the people do not welcome you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, the kingdom of God has come. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Um, so you guys see similarities? Mm -hmm. expansions yeah a lot of expansions mm -hmm. um, it is interesting why in both you know the command to stay in one house mm -hmm. I don't know why that would be significant except I mean practically I guess it makes sense on one level you've already gotten sheets dirty you might as well just stay there for a while don't get everyone sheets dirty <laughs> on the other hand the person has to host you and feed you the whole time so you know the longer you stay the more they're giving good question right mm -hmm. yeah but so so then i oh i do have i i skipped okay look at our luke 9 5 wherever they do not receive you as you leave that town shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them okay and so then they went out and proclaimed the good news and healed people so those those two factors are the same so um so I was, I was looking at that because you noticed in the other one, it's expanded a little bit more and he brings up Sodom and Gomorrah. So what have you, what do you guys think when you read this sentence, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them? I keep thinking of Lois's book where she's got a whole article on the fact that when you're walking around, I can't, I, I'm going to misquote you Lois, forgive me, but I'm going to say it. 
what you're talking about is you're talking about the fact that this, these guys are walking on these dusty streets. They are covered in dust. Yeah. And basically it's like, I don't know, it's, it's a bit like, I guess if you're shaking the dust off, you're saying, right, it's enough. It's a bit like a dog coming out of a, out of a pond and shaking all his water all over you, <laughs> saying, I've had a good time and now I'm off. But I don't think it's quite that. I think it really is. A, it's not exactly a curse, but it's simply saying, right, I've had enough. Okay. Um, yeah. Like <laughs> could, could it be linked to the Leverite marriage? Where if you rejected the bride, you threw your shoe into the ring, as it were. Huh. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, I've heard some uh, comment that it, may refer to nehemiah 5 13 when god shakes the dust out of every man who doesn't keep his promises oh that's good yeah yeah i was thinking i had heard some uh uh let's see I, um this nehemiah it says i also shook out the fold of my garment and said so may god shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise so may he be shaken out and emptied uh so definitely it is a sense of uh some kind of a uh, in the same way you know taking the foot off of the unsandaled man it's a sense of you should be ashamed of yourself I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. you know yeah but i don't think you want to muddle it up with the foot thing because i think taking those yeah. shoes off is to do with getting rid of rights no, and you've got some very deep thinking to it. I'm getting very excited about shoes. No, that, no, you can take out that the that reference, but yeah, the whole metaphor of shaking out dust is yeah. a. Where's uh, yours? I've got um, Monica's five thirteen near my five thirteen. Have you got another one? Marcia's five thirteen. I mean, uh, I uh, Marcia's was near my thirteen. You were in the same place. Yes. Great. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. okay um so if we compare back to luke 10 10 but whenever you enter a town and the people do not welcome you mm -hmm. go into its streets and say even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off against you and so in our passage it says it's a testimony to them here they're wiping off the dust that clings to our feet they're wiping off against them mm -hmm. and so um Earlier, I think it was in this, when we were talking about the lady who, who washed Jesus' feet with her tears and her hair, and, and Jesus says to the Pharisee, you didn't even bring me water to wash my feet. Remember that story a while back? So part, I mean, Jesus, part of hosting is you bring water and you wash people's feet, right? Because it's very dusty outside. And um, that much has stayed the same through the years. You know, you get really dusty feet. And so the fact that they have dust on their feet means they're travelers. And if the dust is still on their feet, that means nobody's welcomed them in their house. You know, no one's washed off that dust for them. Mm. And, and their own lack of inviting them in is a testimony against them. I don't think here that they're, you know, condemning them to hell or anything, but they it's it's a serious affront to not host a guest and um josh tilton i just read an article Do you guys know um jerusalem school uh, mm -hmm. sorry jerusalem perspective david bivens jerusalem perspective mm -hmm. um, so josh tilton is like uh david bivens understudy he wrote an article Kind of more focused on on the Luke 10 one, but um, just what what did that mean to shake the dust off? And so basically, he's saying that that it is it is a sign of inhospitality. Mm -hmm. And if mm -hmm. if the I'll quote him: If the townspeople had fulfilled the basic obligations of hospitality, there would have been no dust on their feet for the apostles to shake off. And so it's just kind of like evidence, mm -hmm. like you've been caught being completely unhospitable and so that's why in luke 10 12 it says jesus says i say to you it will be more bearable for sodom on that day 
than mm. for that town. Oh. And um, I know Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah have been remembered for various and many sins. Even in the Bible, you can follow um, references about them. Um, you know, whether it's pride, whether it's um, sexual immorality, with all kinds of different things. But if you go and read the very first story about Sodom, you will see that they are terribly inhospitable. That is, that is a supreme sin of theirs. And they go so far as not, not, just, not just that they don't help the stranger, the foreigner traveling through, they actually want to go out and hurt them. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. like, it's the most unhospitable, the opposite of hospitable that you could ever be. Mm -hmm. And so, interesting. So to me, this, this cool. image of shaking off the dust mm -hmm. um, does seem to be related to hospitality. Yeah, cool. Because, because yeah. that would make a, a good link to the story of Sodom. That's the connector mm -hmm. there, that Sodom was known for their terrible inhospitality. Mm -hmm. It's a, there's a strange modern link, isn't it? And it happens a lot, particularly with Chinese and Japanese visitors. They want to take off their shoes. I mean, I don't want to get into the shoe taking off biblically, <laughs> but in terms of cultural thing, if they take off their shoes, it, it's a sort of sign that they're welcome to come into the house. I'll take my shoes off. Huh. And if you don't want them in, well, don't bother to take your shoes off. You know, you can stay there. Ah, yeah, yeah, so it's, yeah. It's very yeah. similar. Right. Well, we take our shoes off in our house too, mm -hmm. because right. outside is dusty and dirty, and it's easier to keep the house clean if you take your shoes off. Right. Unless our floor has gotten too dirty, and then I'll tell people, please leave your shoes on. <laughs> <laughs> but that's. I remember when well, I. I've got one more reference for the idea of why not move house to house. Mm -hmm. Um, from uh. Babylonian uh, Arachim 16b. Where are you? The master once said, a border who moves, a border who moves from house to house brings disrepute on himself and his house. Where is this written? This Talmud. was uh, Babylonian Talmud Arachim 16b. Huh. Well, ooh, brings disrepute, huh? Okay. If he moves from house to house. And then also the example of Elisha in 2 Kings 4, 8, how he just stayed with he went the to one that same lady. Shunammite woman. Well, she made him a room. You know, she set up a nice little motel for him. So, right. Mm -hmm. I guess mm -hmm. that does the whole disrepute thing. If you leave someone's house, but you're staying in the same city, it makes it look like they weren't good enough for you or they couldn't host you. So I can see how that could bring a bad name to them. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. mm -hmm. Even though like in today's standards, it's so weird. Like you would, you would think, oh, I don't want to be a burden to them. So I'll like share my burden with somebody else. Mm -hmm. I've actually had the experience of somebody moving out and feeling very offended. <laughs> and they went to Liz and Liz and I had a sort of quite a big thing about it. I mean, <laughs> it's not so little. It's quite a big thing. Yeah. And I think it's not, it's not just linked to, to the to, to, to the to the hostess. It's to do the host. I mean, no, I, I mean the guest. The guest has got to think about you know what I'm doing. But the reality is, when somebody moves from house to house, they do leave all their clutter and their dirty sheets and whatever, and they're just moving on to someone else because they'll think they'll get it cheaper or nicer or whatever it happens to be. And it's quite. It's 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 not an un. It's 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 a modern issue even today. Of course, <laughs> yeah. I've read Jew, uh, kind of Jewish ethics articles where, um, because hospitality is so kind of highly emphasized, they were uh, they uh, they were quoting a rabbinic discussion of when is it all right to, I guess I'd say make a white lie. It's when somebody asks you whether you had a nice time staying with your someone who hosted you. you what you should not say is I had a wonderful time because then everybody will know that that person spends a lot of money on their guests and then it will make them 
uh, it, it, you're um, forcing them into showing tons of hospitality to everybody. And so it's like, watch out, guard what, what people have done for you. You make other people feel bad. But it tells you there's some, you know, there's social climate. You think of the Pharisees inviting him in and not necessarily. And so I would imagine there's a lot of kind of social ladder stuff going on. <laughs> we're back at the, we're back at the shame ethic. Uh, what, I didn't catch it. We're Sharon? back at the shame ethic, I said. That, yeah, that's it. Yep. Don't, don't move around. Too good and don't make it too bad. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. 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 And, and Jesus honors that you know he tells them to stay in that place and eat what they give you is that from i'm already mixing my mind whether that's from luke 9 or luke 10 um but like oh that isn't luke 10 stay in the same house eating and drinking what they give you so don't just like oh, i don't like your cooking i'm gonna try a different house you know it's like that is not the issue here and don't make it the issue or else you will basically um cause people's attention to be diverted or you could shame people you know and and obviously if if this message is for poor people let's say a poor person is your host and they're giving you whatever they have which might not be much you know eat it and enjoy it and just go with it mm -hmm. um yeah. what's interesting is that we still haven't really been able to talk about this power and authority that they've got over the demons and to heal diseases. And then we get all this long thing about, you know, how to behave when you're traveling. Mm -hmm. As though, I don't know, it's quite, extra it's quite extraordinary, the, the sort of emphasis. And a, and a worker deserves his pay. Mm -hmm. it's so so these people are going around working i mean well that's what i'm saying the the culture has this idea of a traveling teacher that would actually stay with you so there is such a concept already existing this is not something new mm -hmm. um or jesus couldn't have given these instructions it just wouldn't have worked um mm -hmm. but but so what is this work that's happening as you're hosting these people i mean I would assume it's much what Jesus has done where you're sitting down, you're having meals together and you're teaching and you're also um, either people are coming to you or you're going to them and healing. So exactly how that happened. I don't know. Like, would you, I mean, it does say to proclaim that the kingdom of heaven is here. So maybe even before you arrive at someone's house, you've already been talking like that. And so it's made people conscious of it. Maybe they would already be bringing sick people to you. I don't know. Um, otherwise, how, how would you heal the sick? Would you walk around in the city square? Or I guess you'd start asking people what, what their issues are. He's come straight from the, we've just had Jairus' daughter. Yeah. And he's just raised this child from the dead. Mm -hmm. And it, it's it's a sort of I mean unless there's some crazy link but I missing link but Luke seems to be pretty continuous now when you just you know the next thing we're doing is calling these twelve together and giving them apparently the same power and authority over the demons that that he's just had and if and that's the case in they've already they're already doing something in some way yeah in chapter four as you're reading through word keeps spreading about him every time there's a healing and also he's raised the dead um so you have several healings several raising of the dead and and then the word is spreading around and obviously his disciples are doing things in his name i wonder he, if if you know, Jesus is wildly popular and everybody's saying, ooh, come to our village next. He'll say, well, I'm sending my two best, or I'm sending this disciple. So they've got, at least they, maybe they have a pre-announcement before they come. They don't just kind of wander in and hope people yeah. recognize them or something. I don't know. Presumably, presumably they would have um, started off in the synagogues. Yeah, I mean, oh. Paul always did. Mm -hmm. mm. Right. Yep. So, yeah, that is good. Like, it reminds me of today. Um, you know, if you go to the Wailing Wall here on Friday evening, you should get an invitation home for dinner. Yeah. 
if, if you make it clear that you have nowhere to go. Um, I used to work for a family, uh, an Orthodox family, who I would help them because I was a goy and I could do some things that they couldn't do on Shabbat. And um, so we'd prepare things for dinner and we never knew how many people would be there because a husband would go to the wall and he'd meet people there and, and invite him for dinner. No, so fun. He might bring home two people and he might bring home 10 people. Ooh. We didn't know. So you had to just kind of prepare <laughs> as much as possible. So it I kind know, of reminds me I've had lots of people staying with me who've done that and they've joined, they've got there and there've been 10 or 15 extras. I yep. mean, huge, great, whatever. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. You hear the same thing from my Jewish ethics books. Um, there's, they tell a story. Uh, I guess there's a saying as, um, um, charity, um, hospitality saves unto death. I'm not sure. It's a, a, a and, uh, it's kind of like if, or if you do a good deed, it'll save you from death. And so this guy's little son said, uh, um, well, you could see he was misunderstanding it. Then they invited an elderly man home for Shabbat, and they fed him well, and you could see that. But he was really on his last legs, and and uh, but they gave him a bed to sleep in, and then the, the little boy comes up to his dad and says, oh, that's going to give us, you know, luck so that it will save us from death. And he says, no, no, no. Charity saves his life from death, not yours, his. <laughs> But the point, you can see how important it is. It's just echoing kind of your stories is it's really important. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and I like it. Um, the great thing about hospitality is you don't know the person, and especially hospitality to strangers. That's the amazing thing. And so that's also part of, you know, Bedouin culture, and we see it in Abraham. Um, Mm. And the beauty there is it's simply because you're human, simply because you're another human made in God's image. That's why I invite you in and honor you. I know nothing about you and it doesn't matter. Like that's the only thing that matters mm. yeah. and to treat other people as humans. And mm. as like, that's all that matters is, is such a wonderful value, you know? Yeah. And so yeah. hospitality forces you to do that because you don't know who these people are. Wow. Wow, wonderful. Um, in, the, in the case of the 72, if you look in Luke 10, 17, they come back and it sounds like they're pretty surprised at the results. Because so it says, then the 72 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. So he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Look, I've given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and on the full and on the full force of the enemy. I mean, authority against the full force of the enemy, I would say. Um, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names stand written in heaven. So, it is, it's a nice thing here when, when Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I mean, I haven't, research all of what that means but to me he's saying this is a significant moment this is like who who jesus is and his ministry is official because it's spreading it is the kingdom of heaven and that's when you know satan falls from heaven that would mark the end of the previous era and the start of the kingdom of heaven mm -hmm. um and back to what you were saying Gemma for sure it entails demons submitting to Jesus name. Sure. And this, this idea of authority. And it's interesting because it's like the enemy, the, the devil or Satan, uh, it, it says here in my version over power of the enemy. So they had power over the enemy. It's like the devil actually loses his power to keep people in the bondage that they're in, which means that the kingdom of heaven becomes a reality. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because mm -hmm. Jesus came, you know, the, to set captives free, mm -hmm. you know, so, to give people, mm -hmm. fix the brokenness, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
so back to our, let me scroll back up. I'm scrolling back and forth between Luke 9 and Luke 10. Um, in the middle, we also have a section where people couldn't cast a demon out. So that's an interesting contrast between the two success stories. Mm. Um, We're still in practicing mode. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. Mm. I mean, so many of us wouldn't, wouldn't be in practice as well. Like I can't, I can't imagine going out there and doing exactly this. Mm -hmm. but, the, well, but the disaster, if you like, or the failure was a complete contrast after the, the transfiguration. Mm -hmm. And it's also mixed up. I mean, it's quite a long bit to look at if you're really going to look at it, because it's also to do with somebody driving out demons in your name. We tried to stop him because he doesn't follow you. I mean, that's another whole thing about sure. yeah. you know, fate. You know, you, you do miracles and you, you've done miracles and whatever, but the Lord says, I never knew you. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a huge, that's a huge subject. Mm -hmm. I have a kind of a, a something that you started talking about. Um, <laughs> the line, a worker deserves his pay. You yeah. know, you're not bringing anything because people are going to provide everything. And I uh, wondered if when Paul's talking about, um, uh, you know, he, he is earning money on his, you know, he's tent making, even though Jesus just said, don't bring anything with you. He's bringing stuff along with him. Whether what I find interesting is that, you know, Paul doesn't say, well, if Jesus said that I got to not bring my stuff with me, but I, 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 I uh, wondered, um, uh, I guess part Partly, you know, some of us who are in ministry or running things, you know, you always, so should I have an outside job or should I just as the Lord to provide? What shall we do? Shall we? Right. So. And, and essentially both, both things can work. Right. Give God. Yeah. Um, I didn't know if you had any comments or not. Well, I mean, I know when, after the crucifixion resurrection, you know, his advice changes, you know, when you go mm -hmm. out. But at this point, that's true. Um, and also, I think once you leave Israel again, you're leaving this whole culture of entertaining teachers, and a yeah, culture that's true. already trying to learn. And you're you're inviting a rabbi home and trying to learn from him. If you mm -hmm. go out to the goyim, you know they might not even have that concept. So it would be a very different yeah. um, world out there. Yeah, and he also. Well, we'll get, I'm sure we'll get to it later, but he, you know, he um, talks about do not throw your pearls to pigs, uh, uh, cast your pearls to swine, and uh, it's, and it's, or they'll come and attack you. It seems like he's defending, he's, you know, the disciples are getting more and more opposition, and he's like, look, you know, the shaking off of your dust, the, he can hear him counseling them all the way along about how to deal with the difficulties of their mission, but we haven't gotten there yet. Just thinking ahead. Do you think that the 12 and the 70 or 72 is kind of looking forward to bringing the gospel first to Israel and then to the nations? I mean, those numbers are very stereotypical. Um, mm -hmm. But nowhere does it say that, you know, obviously the 72 are, are Jewish as well. Um, but, I mean, you can always see pretty numbers and, and find symbol there. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Could be. Yeah, could be. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yep. I mean, certainly within, within Jesus' ministry, he points out, all the gentiles as well you know you know when he says a centurion i haven't seen faith like that in israel and then he brings up well there were many widows in elijah's day but he was sent to this and you know yeah. so he he quotes a list of gentiles who were um recipients of god's kingdom mm. because you know 
Hmm. And yeah. Mm -hmm. So you could you you could see that the numbers as kind of symbolic, 12, 72. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Of it's, course. It, what is interesting is that in in the original verses we were looking at in nine one, hmm. it's a sort of it's a, like a sort of a basic, absolute trusting in him to do what it is. Yeah. You're going to have authority and power. Now go out and do There's only 12 of them. They're not in twos at this point. Yeah. They haven't got each other for moral support. You 12 go out and basically try it out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, you know, either I'm right. See, you know, see I'm right or sort of thing. Yeah. So it takes faith to do that. Actually. And it takes huge faith. And I think the whole later on thing when the Lord tells you, you do, you should be teaching here and you could be doing a job there or whatever it is. That's another whole ball game because we're in a different place. Sure. Sure. We are. Um, Gary and I were talking, he brought up uh, the Exodus. How it's kind of like, you know, sending out the disciples, the 12, you have the 12 tribes leaving Egypt and going to the wilderness. And basically they had to be completely dependent on God. They didn't have stuff for the journey. Mm, that's, ooh, that's good. Ooh, yeah. Don't let your bread rise. Um, however, I mean, there are little verses here and there, which I pointed out like, well, they did plunder Egypt and they did leave with all these cattle and whatever. But, but that's that same concept of you're completely dependent on God in this trial. Um, journey you could say yeah that's good and it's interesting that it, that it was the 12 spies that went in and basically only two were found faithful in this trial now here we've got 12 going in and we're we're assuming that they were found faithful and then the numbers go up to 70 or 72 which you, whichever but it's there is the, the, there may well be a link mightn't there in terms of what you might call spiritual principle. Hmm. Right. That's good. So, um, hmm. so we, we have, we should also talk about uh, verse seven, back to uh, Antipas, Herod the Tetrarch, Herod Antipas. Hmm. Um, he's confused because he starts hearing about everything that was happening. Hmm. And um, of course, he's, it's his job as ruler to kind of know the pulse of the people. And so some people were saying that John had been raised from the dead. And so, of course, that confuses him because he had John the Baptist beheaded. <laughs> he's like, I already killed that guy. Well, who are you talking about? Um, and it's interesting because we have this same threesome, like when... When Jesus says, who do people say that I am? Well, some say that you are Elijah, Elijah or some say when you're one of the prophets of long ago. Then you know, but who do I, who do you say that I am? And yeah, so you have these several echoes in Luke's gospel and I'm sure elsewhere um, have these explanations of who Jesus' identity is. And even on the cross, I'm reminded of, you know, when some people he hear to speak and they think he's calling for Elijah, there's this concept that um, Elijah comes in front of the Messiah. So mm -hmm. he's somehow connected to that, let's say, end times or messianic age. But the lot, I mean, we've, we've spent weeks, haven't we, by seeing how this... John the Baptist comes in the spirit of uh, the spirit of Elijah with on him, and the whole thing in Malachi about um, right ab about the spirit of Elijah and when uh, turning the, the the children to the fathers and back again, and and I was thinking too about the link with um, so many things. Where was I thinking about it? it? Wasn't in context here, but so many of of the of the miracles that one sees and events that one sees again in Acts, have a throwback to what Elijah did or what Elisha did in terms of raising the dead and so on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then when the prophets of long ago had risen, either to be resurrected or I'm just reminded of when in Deuteronomy, when Moses says there will be a prophet that I will raise up 
from among you like me, like yeah. a like Moses. And if Moses in Jesus' day was so revered that he was, he was almost, he was like right under God, you know, he was really almost quasi divine. Um, then to think that someone greater than Moses, it's mm -hmm. kind of um, mind blowing, really. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so it, it's it's interesting that that Herod's. Um, First of all, Herod's hearing about Jesus. He's picking up on it, and he's trying to figure out who he is. It also kind of shows you the the gap in time. Like I don't know how much time has gone by, but John the Baptist already had had a full ministry, which we know Jesus was baptized by him. But like Jesus hadn't begun his ministry. John had already had a full ministry, and at this point, he's been beheaded. So his ministry came and ended because of his beheading. And, um, and then that's when Jesus comes. Um, and it's, it's all during this one Herod's lifetime. And so he, he's kind of like, it's, it's like a echo from the past or from his perspective, he feels like he's cut off one head and two more have grown kind of thing. Like, it's, it's interesting he must well, also have a guilty conscience because he kept trying to see him the last bit of verse nine. Oh, i've got have you got that yes and, and if and you look at the, was, it says if you look at the story of how john the baptist gets he didn't want to do it and he didn't even, then he makes this oath which is so stupid i forget where it is but he makes an oath that you know you can have anything that you want it's a good example of not making oaths and <laughs> You know, and he, he ends up having to, having to having to cut off his head, and he didn't want. And he 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 succumbs to pressure. And as I was thinking about it, it's a bit like Pilate. You know, Pilate gets a very bad rap, but in fact, three t three times he says this man's not guilty. This isn't, you know, this man's okay. He passes them on to, him on to somebody else, and finally, pressure from the world. You know, oh, we've got no, you know, we've got no king but Caesar. He gives in. And John the Baptist a bit the same. How's he? He's going to lose face. But all these and now he wants to really want. He really wants to see this guy Jesus because who knows who he is. Yeah, but, but we don't know why he wants to see him. We just said he was um, searching to see him. Yeah. Right? You know, because um, Herod the Great had said he wanted to see this new Messiah child mm -hmm. or this new king. Oh, that's true. Um, and he yeah. wanted to kill him. So. I mean, all these rulers, all these Herods especially, they're just trying to maintain their power. So they're trying to make sure they know what the people, what's going on in the popular mm -hmm. ideas and who, who the people are that are making waves or making um, a splash. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure his intentions would have been good to see Jesus. Um, so my my dis, my my analysis of him having slightly guilty conscience is a bit off. Well, I mean, if, but if I think it can be both and. I mean, I think the trying to hang on to power is what really matters. Yeah. Yeah, right. and you can still be curious. Of course, you're curious. Yeah. yeah, but it does say something where it's kind of that. Uh, it, 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 like you said, Gemma, that both of those stories kind of say it's not exactly. Herod's and Pilate's desire, it's almost, they've been tricked almost into taking the action that they're, they've been pushed into it. Partly, you know. It, they both uh, want to keep in power. And the interesting yeah. thing is that their conscience says, this guy's okay, yeah. this guy shouldn't do it, I really like yeah. this guy, whatever. And but yeah. the, the, the pressure is either here with Herod is, yeah. you know, maybe we've got another troublemaker who's going to threaten me and Pilate, it's very clear. We have no king but Caesar, and for fear of Caesar, he does what he does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So in Luke 23, 6, in the crucifixion, now when Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. When he learned that he was from Herod's jurisdiction, he passes the buck. Sent him over to Herod, who also happened to be in Jerusalem at that time, because all the feasts, all the people um, <coughs> had to come to Jerusalem. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him and was hoping to see him perform some miraculous sign. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Herod questioned him at considerable length. Mm. Jesus gave him no answer. Which verse are you in at the moment? That was uh, Luke 23, verse 9. Well, I started reading at verse 6, middle of 6. So he, yeah, so he had wanted to see him for a long time. I think, at least in the crucifixion account, it sounds like he's curious and he wanted to see him perform some miraculous sign, but it's more like seeing a performing monkey. It's not that no, he no. was seeking God's kingdom, you know, yeah, right, right. just, just more yeah. of a curiosity. Like do some miracles for me, kind of like yeah. the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and similar to what people were saying, Jesus on the cross. Well, you know, you said this and this, why don't you do that right now? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's good. Very good. Mm -hmm. So, um, those are verses today, and Gary's reminding me that we need to wrap up the hour. Uh, it, obviously, these verses just lead into the next one, so we'll we'll have to come back next week to look at the next chunk. Mm -hmm. um, there's a little bit of a segue. Uh, because the apostles do return in verse 10. But we don't get much of the report like we did in verse um, in chapter 10. We get a little fuller report when the disciples come back. Um, but it, it seems positive. And then, and then we get the next miracle story. So come back next week. Um, but my takeaway, I guess, is both the faith... In, in setting out to do what Jesus asked, to proclaim the kingdom of God, you know, that was definitely a step of faith because they really didn't have anything else to fall back on other than Jesus sending them out. You know, they had no other thing. That um, I know a lot of times we, we want to have a plan B or something else we can fall back on if it doesn't work out kind of thing. And so the very fact that they didn't have that is what proves their faith. And then just that that um, hospitality yeah. being so so important, and and again on the basis that other humans are humans, and that's that's all we need to know in order to be hospitable. Nothing else actually matters. Just that they're humans, and we need to reach out and yeah. people in. Yeah. Um, does anyone else have a um, ending? point that they haven't gotten to make tonight before we turn off the recording? I, it's not so much a, a ending point, but simply the point that you can, that it ties back to Sodom and Gomorrah and their lack of hospitality. I never had made that connection before. And it's a delightful connection is now you can see yeah. why is, why is that coming up? Why did he pull that out of yeah. Wherever. Why would you refer to that particular? Yes, exactly. And once again, because he's incredibly well versed, and you find analogies in scripture. And again, I don't think like these cities that didn't accept his disciples. I don't think he's you know sending them all to hell forever. Like they're just terrible. Hmm. Um, but they're completely missing out because they didn't even take these people in. They're missing out on this whole breaking out of the kingdom of heaven. So it's, it's really, it's sad. You know, there, it's a huge missed opportunity. Mm 